All right, we are live. I'm trying to get this right. Peace, family. We came here tonight uh, to honor one of our great brothers, a great community activist, an international political leader, a minister, a great orator, a brother, who is known as Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. <clears throat> Most of you around now probably don't even know who that is. <clears throat> and that is a testament to uh, partial failure of the people who have come before you to create the institutions to present material, documentaries, and other things that, that can correctly document the history of the greats that have come before us. <clears throat> there are books written and they're not very good books to talk about the reality of what happened to this man in his life. Hal Moore Jr., sometimes called, uh, at, use, using different last names, um, primarily raised by his, his auntie. And I came to know Dr. Khalid Muhammad because he came to Philadelphia in 1998 and did a lecture there, and I attended that lecture. And I had never, you know, I'm young. I had never heard anybody talk or speak like that, ever. And since then, I've never heard anybody speak like that in a way that uh, they understood the condition of our people and could elaborate what were the main things that we needed to help. Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad was the national representative of Minister Louis Farrakhan and a member of the Nation of Islam. <clears throat> he joined the Nation of Islam in approximately late 1960s, 1970. I believe it was when he was in Louisiana at Dillard that uh, Minister Farrakhan either came to Dillard or somewhere in the vicinity of Dillard and did a lecture. So most people don't know that Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad was in the nation while uh, the messenger was alive. All right. Um, and when Warthur Dean Muhammad, then Wallace <coughs> D. Muhammad, took over the nation at, as the head, uh, Dr. Khalid, who was then known as Hal X, went to Africa and he began to help uh, Idi Amin with the struggle that Uganda was going through for their sovereignty and their independence and their autonomy. And Dr. Africa had been, I mean, Dr. Uh, Khalid Abdul Muhammad had been all over Africa. In fact, the first $5 million loan, actually, this is the second one because Muammar Gaddafi gave a loan to the Nation of Islam, I believe was in the amount of $2 million while the messenger was here so that they could build headquarters in Chicago. And later, uh, Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad went back to Libya after the messenger was gone and the minister was the head of the nation at the time and uh, brokered a deal to get a $5 million deal for uh, using it to build up the nation of Islam. So Muammar Gaddafi played a lead role in the international exchange of resources to help build up the nation of Islam during the time of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and during the time of uh, Mr. Farrakhan. Now, <clears throat> I'm not here to uh, 
load myself up, but I don't have notes to do this presentation. I have no book. I, I have books out. You know myself. This books I study. I don't need books for this. I lived it. And it is a shame that now we look at Muammar Gaddafi, who, as an international leader, had something called a green book. And the prediction in his green book was that the blacks would rule the earth again. And he came up with a theory for a different type of governance other than the fake democracy and the socialism and the communism that are primary, uh, predominant on the earth now. So that book is online, the green book is online, but his, pre his prediction was that the blacks would rule again. Now, Muammar Gaddafi was a Muslim, an Arab, but he took throughout his lifetime, the resources from the oil money that Libya had and gave free homes, free arms and free education to the nationals of Libya. He took the oil money and invested it in the people. Anyone, I didn't, I have never, I didn't have a chance to go to Tripoli or visit Libya uh, during the time while he was alive. He was too young, you know, moving around and doing what I was doing. But um, from what I read, Libya was one of the most advanced nations on earth. And it was Barack Obama who created the climate with the lies that he told that uh, Muammar Gaddafi was violating the human rights of his own people that set the stage for NATO to put in a false regime and have Muammar Gaddafi assassinated. So Dr. Khalid Mohammed went to Libya, got the money, brought the money back here for that building that y'all sitting in right now in Chicago, where you are made either directly or indirectly to frown upon this man. Most of y'all black asses was not even around. This man literally riding in the desert of, of Tripoli on mopads to come get your ass some money so that you can have some restitution for the circumstances that our people have experienced. I can remember very clearly the day I was in FOI class and we had an FOI meeting and Minister Farrakhan broadcast a presentation that is now on YouTube. It wasn't on YouTube then. YouTube did not exist when this speech happened. But he came before the FOI and said out of his own mouth that it was not the enemy that killed Khalid. It was a law that did it himself. Those were your exact words. And the question that I have always asked directly to him by writing and indirectly, why would Allah, who is not a mystery God, according to our teachings, kill a man who is standing up for the liberation of his people with you, with a gun inside of his Bible, to stand by you when nobody would stand beside you, why would you say that after he died? A soldier, because of a disagreement that y'all had. Why would you say that? That would be like me saying, you didn't practice how to eat to live, Minister Farrakhan, and therefore you are suffering the chastisement of Allah with bags on you and you can't even take a piss or a shit. When you said yourself out of your own mouth that if God lets you live to be 90, you'll be standing tall. When God, if God lets you live to be 100, you'll be standing straight up. If God lets you live to be 120, you'll be standing straight up. 
You can't stand up right now. You leaning over, as the Quran says, they are like propped up pieces of wood. Their speech pleases you. So I'm not here to befriend anybody. I'm here to warn our people that if you stand up for your people, the Negroes amongst you are going to identify you and they are the gatekeepers and the snitches and the house niggas that will get your ass killed. That is their job and I'm about to prove it. I did a lecture called the assassination of black leaders. I did that lecture 13 years ago, 12 and a half years ago. I still have the notes from that lecture that I'm about to read from you. Then I did a public indictment on Malik Zulu Shabazz and I'm gonna tell you exactly why. Cause he's out here writing books and lauding himself as some type of great student of Dr. Khalid Muhammad that Dr. Khalid Muhammad loved when that is not the case. See, they're counting on people who were there to either be too scared to say something or not know what to say because they weren't present and aware of what was going on. Well, I was there. And there's a lesson in all of this. I'm not here to talk bad about Minister Farrakhan, Malik Zul, Shabazz. I could give two fucks about them at all. I don't think about them and they have no concern to me. But the lesson is one, grimy ass niggas who dress up and play a role that they actually are not. And two, the things that are holding your community back or have held your community back because you are not astute enough to vet the information to understand how that is going to affect your children's children's children when you let Negroes do what I'm about to show you what happened to this man. Now, at the basis of the uh, dispute between Minister Farrakhan and Dr. Khalid Muhammad, which is the key to this discussion, because yes, it's his birthday, but he got killed. Like many of us who came before. But the basis of it was a speech in 1993 at King College, where the students... Black students invited Dr. Khalid out to speak onto a campus and Jewish and other whites came out and were calling for the death of the speaker and the death of his teacher at the time. With handbills and flyers with that information and signs up on it. Now that's a crime. You can't publicly call for the death of someone through audio, visual, physical means. That is a death threat. And in any municipality, county, state, you can be charged with a crime. But rewind. We are people who went through a genocide so deep that we don't even know who our real ancestors are. And the state and private entities participated and are currently participating in that act where you are people lose their whole identity. Not somebody who hurts your feelings because of what they said in a speech, which is free speech. Are we going to compare what someone said that some of us disagree with in a speech that lasted an hour and 48 minutes? Two decades, centuries of genocide? Are we actually about to have that conversation? Are we about to have a conversation about Dr. Khalid because he said bad things about uh, Jewish people, other white people in this speech? When I can go to the Talmud right now and prove that the Jewish people are the origin of the concept of black inferiority. Their religious texts currently have that material in it, and so do the Arabs. Satan is black. 
in the sense of a psychological uh, asymmetrical warfare to change the literature at the time of the Umayyads who were black Egyptians who started Islam in that era. Are we about to do that conversation? Are we about to have this conversation about how deeply rooted the disrespect of our people is? So much so we are now participating in it willingly and ignorantly, all due to the fact that a crime, several crimes, were and are being carried out on us and we don't even know that they're crimes because we don't know our political status, our history, our heritage. Are we about to have that conversation? You can have that conversation. I don't have conversations like that anymore. I'm here to help people who don't know who Dr. Khalid Muhammad was for real and what his agenda was. Dr. Khalid Muhammad left the Nation of Islam to join with the new Black Panther Party but that wasn't his ultimate objective. Dr. Khalid Muhammad's ultimate objective was to develop a plebiscite for restitution and reparations for his people. And he said that out of his own mouth. As a matter of fact, I had never even heard the word plebiscite until I heard it come out of his mouth. And everything that we have done in Arna is based on someone educating a young man, me at the time, very young, on what a plebiscite was and why it was necessary. And I took that. And after they killed him, I said, you know what? We can't let the brother die in vain. Watching his lectures all over YouTube, yeah, that's great. But who is going to carry on the work of him and others? Who's going to do that? Who's going to do that? Brother Farrah Gray, who is his son, I'm pretty sure it was a traumatizing event to lose your father. But the avenue that your father was on, he's not on that avenue. He's on taking care of his business as he sees fit as a man. And I have, I'm not questioning that. But it's very difficult for you to understand how deep it is to lose your life when you have niggas around you who's supposed to be supporting each other's life. That's a foul ass bunch of niggas. And so it's, it's so much to the degree that so many people have been assassinated that uh, younger people don't even think about helping the black, like, what are you talking about? I'm trying to get money. None of that is valuable. And that means that you're facing extinction if you are not willing to understand the necessity of why a man like that would separate himself from his teacher and move out to say, look, we gotta build some shit or else. So let me go over this information. I'll start with motive. When the Honorable Elijah Muhammad built what he built amongst original people here in North America, he wasn't looking to the Congressional Black Caucus, the Senate, the House of Representatives, the preachers. He wasn't looking to none of those people to help him build it. He took a message, a truth, and went to his people and said, look, either we're going to do this or it's not going to get done. And guess what? It got done. Creflo Dollar wanting a private jet. 
mega million dollar churches. None of that existed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They watched Elijah Muhammad become one of the most wealthy, influential community leaders amongst black people and international leaders in the field of Islam. And they said, man, listen, this man out here balling. Then he got Muhammad Ali. Then he got Malcolm X. Then he got all these other young people he's putting out front to bolster the message, but to build industry, farms, banks, schools. I heard Mr. Farrakhan say he could wake up while he was the minister and go to all black institutions that we own from sunup to sundown, basically. He didn't use those exact words, but that was the sentiment. Most of us don't even know what that's like or to even think. Think about that. Think about you wake up, your children go to your school. You go to the grocery store, you're going to your grocery store. You go to the mechanic, it's the brother in the community that runs the mechanic shop. You're going to take a break and go to the steak and take, the brother's on that too. You're going to go to the mosque. You're not like they are in number 12 where I was in Philly, renting the mosque from Jewish people, having a recurrent drives to take money to build the mosque up. I came out of the, when I came out of college, I took $5,000 cash and put it in the hands of people in the mosque to help build a mosque up. And I believe at that funding drive, we raised about 90000 80000 to $90,000. And all of a sudden, some, some kind of way the money disappeared. Secretary running off with it. How many drives has Minister Rodney Muhammad in mosque number 12 had where the money got stolen and y'all still in the mosque and y'all let him stay over your head while y'all know he's stealing? Yes, I love you, but you are in a dysfunctional relationship and you will let people abuse you. I was there. And anybody at number 12 know that I'm not lying. My head is on the block if I'm lying. So this goes way deeper than Dr. Khaled. This goes into the minds of people who accept abuse as a normal standard of practice, especially from their leaders. You fall in love with popular people because you want to be popular. Let me tell you something about being popular. That shit is whack. In the world that we live in? Oh, yeah, that shit is whack. Nobody, I don't want to be popular. An influencer. What is that, actually? What are you influencing? What are you using as your ultimate goals? What do you want to influence? This is a battle for attention. And this is what is at the core of the problem between Minister Farrakhan and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. You had a young minister who was out here with Tupac and Ice Cube in the videos, getting the attention with the NBA basketball players, uh, getting the young people riled up to do something for their community. Just think, what would make you say, you, Farrakhan, say that Allah killed Khalid Muhammad? You were jealous. You were jealous. And I'm about to prove it. And this is the stain that is on our people because we do not have a knowledge of self. You're reading about a knowledge of self, but to have a knowledge of self is to understand the three sciences that he said that we lost. The science of warfare, the science of business, and the science of mating. You telling me y'all mastering the science of mating? Mastering the science of mating means your children come out superior and therefore your performance is superior. How are you coming out giving birth certificates to the children as 14th Amendment citizens and you understand the science of mating?
You don't understand the science of mating. You don't understand the science of business. And you don't understand the science of warfare. You understand the science of being obedient to a cult leader. That's what you understand. And it's unfortunate for you because that does not equal success for you. So let's go. I'm going to give you the timeline. If you're on IG, you got to go to YouTube or Facebook to see these, what I'm about to show you. Because you won't be able to see it. I'm about to play something from Kwesi Infumu, uh, February of 2000, excuse me, February of 1994. This was after the King College speech was in, which was in uh, late 1993. But I'm going to play this uh, from him. And I want you to listen to what he has to say. When the CBC came to Minister Farrakhan and showed, this is the Congressional Black Caucus. These are the coons and gatekeepers of the wealthy aristocrats. And so they came to the student of the, the Mahdi, the self-guided one and the messenger of Allah. They came to one of their students and made a proposal that he should distance himself away from one of his students because of what he said out of his mouth. These are the people carrying out the gentrification. These are the people carrying out the uh, menticide, the nutricide. These are the people that are doing that. You're negotiating with the enemy? I wish y'all would ever, ever in my life turn my back on one of my brothers for the Congressional Black Caucus. I don't care what the nigga did. See, but when you want position, the myth uh, of Jesus was standing on the mountain and the devil was like, look, I'll give you all this. All you got to do is all you gotta do is submit to what I want you to do. I'll give you all of this. You want this? You want fame? You want, man, listen, ain't nothing. We put cameras all around you. You want money? Man, we got Arab money. We got oil money. We got all kinds of money. We print the money. So let's see what Crazy Infumo has to say. Because y'all, listen, somebody, you know, let me just play this. Let me just play it. Let me just play it. First of all, let me thank you for being patient. Um, we're a bit behind on this press conference due to other matters and things are unfolding regarding other issues. So I, I thank you for that. I announced uh, just over 10 days ago that following a response to the caucus's letter of January 21st to Minister Louis Farrakhan, and immediately after the first black caucus meeting following the congressional recess, that I would have further statements to make regarding our caucus and the Nation of Islam. I have stuck to that timetable. Now hold up, let me ask a question. The Nation of Islam was started by Master Farah Muhammad and teaching the early followers in Detroit. And his primary minister and student became Elijah Kareem, who we now know as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the sole doctrine of the Nation of Islam was to set up an autonomous government. Point number 12, for our people here on this land. That's the goal. And the theology was that the original people are the gods. And these other uh, mutations were devolved beings or devils. What does the CDC have interest in meeting with Minister Farrakhan for? What, what is the real agenda? Now I need you to understand, okay, look, I'm here. That's like me sitting down with the uh, LGBT community to have a discussion on what? What, what am I going to sit down with them for? There would only be one reason I would sit down with them, and that is to teach them that their reality is based on trauma and hormonal disorders, and I have the solution to it. Other than that, I have nothing to say to you. 
So we got to look at interest. What's the interest here? Why are they even mentioned in the Nation of Islam? Why are you coming to the table? When I told y'all that the Department of Justice and the FBI said there were three top level informants in the Nation of Islam, I told you who they were. John Ali, Wallace D. Muhammad, and Minister Farrakhan are those agents. And each one of those three were used to assassinate people, destroy things, and redirect people away from the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad by saying that they were with it at some point or agreed with it. So this is them coming to meet with their agent. And I honestly do appreciate your patience. That response was received today and our first meeting has just concluded. The Congressional Black Caucus uh, appreciates the official reply to our letter of 12 days ago and have been advised that Minister Louis Farrakhan has agreed to convene a press conference here in Washington, D.C. tomorrow to address actions to be taken regarding one of its spokespersons. But we hold up, hold up, hold up. They met with him. They made demands about his student. He came and said, well, I'm about to have the press conference. So the press conference was based on the C, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus making a demand and then him moving. Man, listen, ain't no, ain't no way nobody can press my buttons like that. Ain't no way. That's like Peter Nygaard the billionaire who's in jail right now for human trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, 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 impregnating women and, and running a stem cell uh, company and taking the stem cells from the children that he made with these women. The stem cells. He's stealing the stem cells from aborted people. This is who Minister Fryer called that pressure buttons to come uh, talk against another white man. And y'all motherfuckers got to be out of your mind to look at this and ignore this. But you know what? You are out of your mind. So I'm going to let you stay out of your mind, but I'm going to teach. For what we consider to be evil hey, and teach. vicious remarks made late last year at Keene College of New Jersey. Remarks that I have found since the beginning to be racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, and homophobic. Nowhere in American life can we give sanctuary to such garbage. We believe he owes a public apology to all whom he has offended. However, nor should we give tolerance to remarks such as those made by the junior senator from South Carolina, who also suggested late last year that black people were uncivilized, barbaric, and cannibalistic. We call on leaders of goodwill, regardless of race or religion. All right, I'm going to come off of this for a second. That's crazy and fooling. That's the context. I just wanted you to see it. So you can, so you can get, this, get the context, because I'm not making this shit up. Now, let's go to Minister Farrakhan dismissing Dr. Khalid and insinuating that Dr. Khalid's activity is agent-like activity. Designed, excuse me, designed to stop the progress that he's making in the community. All right, let's 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 rotate, rotate, rotate. I'm not making this shit up. Here we go. Rotate. And the Nation of Islam claim they are moving toward moderate. Look, read the Minister Louis Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam claim they are moving toward moderation and increased tol tolerance. What does that mean? and increased tolerance. You decide. Minister Farrakhan spoke in Washington this afternoon. Recent events surrounding the remarks by one of my ministers 
is causing intense concern among many people. Brother Khalid Abdul Muhammad spoke at King College at the invitation of the students. The students chose his subject for him. During the speech, Brother Khalid made remarks that were not consistent with the proper representation of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his teachings and guidance, myself, and the Nation of Islam. Hold up. Now, when I get to what Dr. Khalid actually said, because the lecture is still up, first of all, he was censored, his speech was censored by the U.S. Congress. The U.S. Congress, which includes the Congressional Black Caucus, can censor the speech of Dr. Khalid Muhammad. But they can't censor the genocide that was happening and is happening with our people. Let me put it in context. A few months ago, it was discovered that Jackson, Mississippi's water is basically fucking done. And the son of, uh, what's his brother's name? I forget his name. But anyway, a great activist that was back in the 60s and 70s, uh, I forget his name, but his son is the mayor in Jackson. And um, so that water, this water situation is, is, is messed up. They had storms in Florida back during hurricane season that messed up the water. That water got fixed by the Army Corps of Engineers within like two weeks. But when you look at the zip code and who was there and what state and federal funding was provided to fix their water, and you look at people right now still in Jackson, Mississippi, who they want to gentrify out of Mississippi to get those black people out, situation still ain't fixed. That's the context. So the U.S. Congress censored a man for what he talked about in regards to the secret relationships of blacks and Jews. And it's an issue. See, what you have to understand here is this, this is uh, warfare. And what is being said is Black man, original man, indigenous man, you don't have the right to speak with authority. You can't even speak with authority. And speaking is not authority. It's just talking. Because we ain't even do nothing yet. We don't have no books out here without lynching, I mean, without sanctuary that go through a lynching history of what? We don't have those things. So let me get to the part that I want to get to. Hill raises the question of okay, Christ's division, self and the nation. Elijah Muhammad, his truth, his guidance, the aim and his purpose for us in America in a manner that would be pleasing to Allah, his message demonstrates that he, Hold in on. his post as his terms, this, this, this. the manner in which those truths were represented. I therefore have dismissed Brother Khaled from his post as minister, representative, and national assistant. Okay, so he got dismissed from his post because the CBC uh, desired that he receive a punishment for what he said. Now you might... Let's let's play let's play Yakub's advocate. You might say, well, this is high-level strategy by Minister Farrakhan, and this high-level strategy is gonna make him more uh effective amongst the people who are at 85% because we need to get to these people. And Dr. Collins' uh, flamboyant speeches were blocking that. Bro, this is 1994. Do you want me to pull up the flamboyant speeches of Louis Farrakhan post 1994? The things that he has said that are equal to or greater in flamboyance than what Dr. Khaled said? 
because we all know we can pull those speeches out. So what was this about? What was this really about? This was about power and the power of one young man to reach young people to change the way that they think. Ice Cube, Tupac, all these other people who are listening to this young man called Dr. Kaliman go all around the nation and talk about restitution, reparations, and all those things. Don't you think that that's a problem? See, you think because somebody talks strong that they actually want to do what they're saying out of their mouth. That's like Jay-Z on a track talking about being a rebel, and we all know he is a coon to the 10th power. He's here to make his money. He's not interested in those things. All that justice reform and all that shit is, look, make it look good. We need somebody who uh, fits the build. This is public relations now. You got to represent your revolutionary black people and you got to say these things out here and not have any intention to fulfill any of the things that you're saying as opposed to somebody who does have the intention joint chiefs of staff capability plus intention equals threat level capability plus intention equals threat level capability i can go to libya and get five million dollars i can go to uganda and talk to idi amin and we can get support internationally from africa this is the same Muammar Gaddafi that offered 45 nations in Africa, RASCOM, Regional African Satellite Network, and a defense system he was working with with China and Russia and a bank to put all the African countries on the gold currency. This, is, this brother is sitting with people like that. Context. He means everything. So... He dismisses him, and then watch what he says. He, he basically insinuates that the ADL is working some type of asymmetrical warfare to get the people around him and in the Black community to do things to stop his growth and love amongst the people, insinuating that Dr. Khalid could be an agent. Until he demonstrates that he is willing to conform to the manner of representing Allah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his truth, his guidance, the aim and his purpose for us in America in a manner that would be pleasing to Allah, his messenger, myself, and the nation. I have an internal and secret document put out. Internal and secret. Out by the Civil Rights Division of the Anti-Defamation League this January. This document reveals their strategy for dealing with Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam. Uh -huh. The ADL raises the question, does Farrakhan's acceptance by the mainstream black community represent a newfound tolerance for anti-Semitism, which the ADL must fight with every weapon at our disposal? Now, stop. Context. Farrakhan's acceptance amongst the mainstream people. Who are the mainstream? These are non-Muslim, non-revolutionary, I guess, and that extension is happening in that group. Farrakhan is now extending that. Now, in warfare, that is a good thing because the further you can reach with your education, the more possibility you can get the help, assistance, business, partnerships that you need to do what? To do what? To build. But if you aren't using it to build, what are you using it for? Fame. Fame. And that's all y'all got now. A famous leader wearing shit and piss bags who uh, taking so much of the enemy's medication that he's groveling over the pulpit saying that nothing that he takes works to take away the pain.
Now, you can make up some spooky shit if you want to. Oh, Allah is putting them against this so he can show how, you know, you, you can make up some spooky shit if you want to. But the body follows biology and law. And if you're fucked up on the inside, it's because you did something to fuck yourself up. That's how this works. What do these weapons include? Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. One of the weapons identified by the ADL and mentioned in their document is their exploitation of, quote, some of the nation's top black political and civil rights leaders oh, on, bring it up. who have long been envious of Farrakhan's ability to reach large enthusiastic audience stating so 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 let's go let's go over this now why is he saying this at a press conference that deals with the suspension or dismissal of dr Khalid muhammad why is he mentioning this that their strategy why is he mentioning this first of all context anybody who went to the million man march in 1995 you get the pre-context you know Khalid muhammad did the speech in 1993 this was 1994 Khalid Muhammad, once he was dismissed, kept teaching. He went all around the country. And in 1994, in Los Angeles, go watch the Steve Coakley lectures. A, a member of the Nation of Islam from, I believe it was Seattle, Washington, was given money, thousands of dollars. A car was rented for him on his behalf. He had guns in the car. He went to the church that Dr. Khalid was supposed to speak at, speak at in L.A. and cut out the back of the fence and had a uh, sniper's rifle that he was going to use to shoot him. And the FOI who were put on duty that day kept trying to get Dr. Khalid to come out of the back door. All this is documented. And instead, Dr. Khalid went out of the front door and he had FOI who were also Crips and Bloods who were protecting him. And the shooter still came around and tried to shoot him. And they, he did shoot him. They did shoot him. But of course, he that dude got dealt with. So this is right in the same year, 1994, they tried to kill the brother. And Steve Coakley tried to tell Dr. Khalid at the time, who was still trying to be loyal to Minister Farrakhan, like, nah, bro, that's them trying to kill you, bro. Wake up. And for those who try to compare this situation between Minister Farrakhan and Dr. Khalid and make it synonymous with Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X, you're doing, your, you're doing yourself a gross disservice. You're doing the people a gross disservice. You're actually just lying. This has nothing to do with these, these scenarios are not even similar in any kind of way. The pretext, the purposes for why there was disputes, are any, they're, not, they're, not even, they're not even close. Dr. Khalid was going around the country and raising up people. And these coons saw it and they called for the Million Man March. And they used their agent to take advantage of the work that Dr. Khalid Muhammad had done on the ground. And yes, the Million Man March was a great event, but go watch the speech. You got two million men there and you call for apologies. This is the pretext for reparations, restitution, governance, all of the stuff we've been talking about, the Republic of New Africa, the, the, the uh, first phase of the Nation of Islam, the Black Liberation Army, the Nation of Gods and Earth, all of these people who have been working all this time, we got to culminate an event and they put an agent at the front of y'all and y'all did not recognize it. And your community is on a sliding board to making the men little Nas X's and the women Glorilla right now. And you are wondering what the fuck happened. I'm telling you what happened. And I'm about to finish it. So let's go to Dr. Khaled. Let's go to Dr. Khaled. Let's see what he had to say about this. I'm not going to waste your time tonight. We're not going to be on here for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. It don't take hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to tell the damn truth. Let's go. Okay. Why 
why is it called the secret relationship between blacks and Jews? Stop. The secret relationship between blacks and Jews is a two volume book put together by, at that time, Dr. Khalid and others in the Nation of Islam who had a research department. And that research department did a study on the history of the Jewish uh, influence, participation in the uh, enslavement and the taking and the theft of our political identity as a people. That happened. Judah Benjamin was one of the largest uh, Confederate slaveholders in the South. Yes, Jewish people have a secret. And their secret is not what Kanye said, that we're Jews because we are not Jews. Or Hebrews or Israelites or any of that. And anybody who wants to have that discussion, I already killed that argument. We showed you the first time the word Israel showed up. It was a de uh, a, uh, a uh, epitaph of protection to the deity El, who was a Levant Canaanite deity, and there was no, there was no Israel. The word Israel appears first in the Ebla tablets. It had nothing to do with no Hebrews or Jews. It was an epitaph to the deity El. And so when they make these claims in uh, the, the book that Kyrie was uh, or, or documented they're promoting and the book saying, oh, yeah, the Hebrews came down into Africa. That was no damn Hebrews. There was a migration of people who had the genetics E1B1A, but those Levantine people were not Hebrews. These were the descent, the, the agricultural uh, uh, foundation of people who became uh, real people in history. Eblites, Canaanites. And yes, they did make migrations into Africa. They weren't no damn Hebrews, though. That came later. So this secret relationship is about the conscripting of a false pseudo-identity called Jewish and trying to make it a lineal, ethnic, and genetic group of people on earth. Jewish people are white people, Eurasians, descendants of Neanderthals and Denisovans. That's it. Who stole pieces of history from indigenous peoples and conscripted a religion and a book from books that we had already written called the Bible. The Bible was written from earlier books, the Ebalite tablets, primarily. So this, this secret relationship between blacks and Jews is the thumb in there. Because first of all, they don't want to confess to the fact that as uh, the Dutch, West Indian Dutch, they're going to the name Dutch during the, during, during the slave trade, that they participated in the destruction of the aboriginal civilizations here in the Moorish civilization that was thriving in West Africa, that the Jews, the Arabs, and the uh, other Africans attacked to destroy they don't ever want that to come out in clear scholastic language. This was a, 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 a foundational attempt to start the storyline for that particular discussion. So this has nothing to do with somebody calling nobody no names. Because first of all, we call them skunks in our lessons. And those lessons come from the Matthew himself. And the answers that were given by Elijah Muhammad. So if anybody name calling, Elijah Muhammad is name calling in the lessons. And so is Master Farah Muhammad. Uh, is, is, is Mr. Farrakhan going to dismiss uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad and Master Farah Muhammad for calling them skunks and cavies. I would like to. I would like to hear the speech for the explanation of the name calling that the math deacon is it name calling or is it real? Keep going. First of all, there are a group of faculty and staff and some Jewish students, I believe, and others from the community who are passing out this wonderful note. I think we should... All right, so that's the flyer he's talking about. And as you go through, he talks about it a little bit. I, I have never been able to get copies of this flyer. I want to get copies of that flyer. I'm going to try to see. I know one person who might have that flyer so I can let y'all see what these people were doing. Death threats. So it wasn't about what people were saying. 
That's see, this is how you miss points. You have to have a deeper mind to understand motivations of people. And the more you focus on that, the easier it is to see the fuckery in people who are out here with uh, disingenuous and dysfunctional motivation. Go over this note and let this note help us to set the tone for the evening. Is that all right? Let me say to you before we even get started. If your seats get too hot for you, don't leave. Just raise up and man it a little bit and sit back down. Everything will be all right. And to the whites who are in the audience, let me say to you before we even get started, it's going to be a rough ride, buddy. It's going to be a rough ride. You better buckle in. Buckle up, guys. Buckle your seatbelts. If for any reason this auditorium becomes depressurized, automatically oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling. Please make sure to fix the, fix the elastic band around your head firmly and put the mask over your mouth and nose first and then help the white person next to you. <laughs> I didn't come to Keene College to tiptoe through the tubes. I didn't come to King College to pussyfoot. I didn't come to King College to dilly dally to beat around the bush. I didn't come to pin the tail on the donkey. I came to pin the tail on the hunky. I came to speak the truth. Whether you like that truth or not, I couldn't give a damn if you stood thousands on the sidewalk passing out leaflets before my people come in here this evening, we have a right to evaluate and examine the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. Good evening. This is the truth hour. And don't you touch that down. You stay tuned in. Let us read November 29th, 1993. A note from the King College Jewish Faculty and Staff Association, shall we? To those attending the secret relationship between blacks and Jews, we affirm the speaker's constitutional right to offer controversial views. But we only ask that this audience use the same critical thinking and evaluation that would normally be expected in a college community. Without prejudging the content of this lecture, the book of the same title by anonymous authors, the Historical Research Department in parentheses of the Nation of Islam, has drawn the repudiation of African Americans like, let's see what this honor roll is here. <laughs> African Americans like Clarence Page, William Raspberry, Stanley Couch, Alice Walker, Ishmael Reed, August Wilson, Mel Reynolds, John Lewis, Uncle Tom, uh, Tom Bradley, <laughs> Stinkin' David Dinkin, Ron Brown, and the late Bayard Rustin. <laughs> Y'all know Bayard, honey. What is your nay-nay's friend? <laughs> Bayard Rustin debated Malcolm X, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Brother Obawali. Brother Malcolm debated on the Ivy League campuses of white America with an eighth grade education from the white man, but supreme wisdom from the old, from Almighty God's man in our midst with that old time knowledge and ancient wisdom from the very beginning the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And Malcolm was able to handcuff scholars all over America. Some crackers, that's what I told you. Some crackers with one PhD, some with two PhDs. But when white folks can't defeat you, they'll always find some Negro, some boot-licking, butt-licking, buck-dancing, bamboozled, half-baked, half-fried, sissified, pumpkin-fied, pasteurized, hum 
merchandise, nigga, that they can cut out in front of you. I hear you had one of these Negroes on campus a few weeks ago, some Negro named Louis Gates. Who let this Negro out of the gate? Oh, Lord, he went at Louis Gates. All right, I ain't going to get that. Y'all see this video. Y'all can go watch the whole thing on King College. Hey, listen, this flames. It's all good. They acknowledge his constitutional right to speak. Then they censored him. All right. So now I have to read one more thing. This was 13 years ago, uh, 12 and a half years ago. I did something called the People's Indictment. And I want you to pay attention to the to the time period. Now, this is this is 12 and a half years ago. Listen to what I had to say, though, on this particular night. I was in New York City when I did this lecture. That's it. Yo. All right, here we go. Hopefully you can see this. Yeah, you can see it. All right. The People's Indictment, part one, regards to the assassination of Dr. Khalid Muhammad. Dr. Khalid Muhammad is turning in his grave. We're sick of Negro sellouts. All right, so this is Monday, April 12, 2010, 15,095 on the Aboriginal calendar at the National Black Theater, which is on which was on Fifth Avenue, 125th Street. Anybody who knows me knows I used to do classes there. All right, so updates on the investigation into the death of Dr. Khalid Muhammad and COINTELPRO, all right? Uh, this memo is an announcement from the International Indigenous Society's Ministry of Defense Subdepartment. We told y'all that we were called ISIS before there was an ISIS, all right? And we created something called a Committee on Assassinations of Black American Leaders, our Harus. Indictment defined, the formal announcement and accusation with supporting evidence of a crime made by a grand jury or someone with delegated authority from a civil government. The act, process, procedure of preparing such written proclamation. Indict, to charge with a crime by formal lawful process. The purpose of this public indictment is to deal with the following issues. I need you to really pay attention to this. I have not edited this document in over 12 and a half years, I just opened this up. I keep every document that I have ever made, every book, every piece of material, every everything I've done in Arna, ISIS, uh, and everything else that I've done. All right. A general update on the assassination of Dr. Khalid Muhammad. In the report on the assassination of Dr. Khalid Muhammad made by the new Black Panther Party, Kiana Ambush, the wife of the great General Khalid Muhammad was accused of negligence and possible conspiracy. Let me give this some context. The New Black Panther Party had a newspaper, and I am speaking specifically of Malik Zulu Shabazz's article in that newspaper, where he tried to put a cloud of suspicion around Kiana Ambush. Now, since the death of Dr. Khalid Muhammad, no one has seen this woman in the public. This woman worked for Freedman's down right here in Atlanta, downtown, which was a Jewish shoe store. And when I show you the photos of the people who shopped at this store, you will understand the context of what I am trying to say. These people service shoes for NBA players, NFL players who have very large feet. Cunning little Jews. They made you know, $1,000 shoes, hundreds of dollars shoes for very wealthy people. But the store is called Freedman's. It's downtown in Atlanta. Kiana Ambush worked for these Jewish people. It was Hasim and Zinga, the former head of the national, uh, uh, the uh, New Black Panther Party, who is now deceased, and Malik Zulu Shabazz, who introduced Dr. Khalid to this woman. He was married to her for three months, and then he ended up dead. But in this newspaper, Malik Zulu Shabazz is playing asymmetrical warfare because he and Kiana are, are, are real, real, real cool. But somebody had to take the blame and she was the least known. So yeah, let's throw the cloud of suspicion on her to divert it from who the real party of interest is. Now this is personal to me because I know what it's like for the enemy to try to put a woman on you. This has happened to me several times. 
So much so, unfortunately, this uh, we had a situation, a scenario with a sister who I was doing business with, who did some uh, great business with me, right? Who I had an interest in. And her background came up with some really shady stuff. It is some shady activity. So I outed her because, listen, I'd rather lose a friend than lose my life. But I thought that she was Asian. Turns out that she wasn't, as far as I know to this particular point. But the point is, it's dangerous out here. So I'm, I'm showing you the personal nature of this. I had women who uh, found out addresses from an ex of places I live, went to the FBI, gave the FBI the address that I was live, go to my mailbox to check the mailbox. I got a card from an FBI agent in my goddamn mailbox. Talk about we would like to speak with you. So I'm showing you how this works. This is a real thing that happens to, to people who are very influential in the sense of capability plus intention equals threat level. And so I had to out somebody who was a great friend of mine. I'm talking, I'll just say her name. You know, she's known online as Leanna Hanel. I had to out her because I was like, oh, it's just girl of Asian. What does she try to do to me? What's going on? Why her background look like this and what's going on? It turned out to be some other types of things. And that's her personal life. And I, I do actually owe her apology for that, which I, you know, I will do. I've talked to her about that. But um, the point is, the shit is dangerous, man. So this man meets a woman. In November of 2000, marries her, goes to Egypt with her, comes back home. Three months later, you're dead. So we got to be very careful about the science of mating. All right. Miss Ambush has never spoken on these issues. We have found evidence that supports that she, Ambush, was not in a conspiracy and that certain parties have used her as a scapegoat. Miss Ambush was not in a governmental conspiracy and has since that time suffered greatly. We will show the proof. In fact, all types of lies have been told on her and her silence is due to fear and the real perpetrators. Now, this is my opinion at that time. I've altered that slightly, but the points that I'm making are still pertinent. Attorney Malik Zulu-Jabaz, who just wrote a book a few years ago or a year ago or something like that, two years ago, on Dr. Khalid Muhammad, positioning himself as some loyal, faithful follower. Attorney Malik Zulu-Jabaz and Hashim Menzinga are being indicted on the following charges, tampering with evidence at the scene of a crime. Now, Malik Zulu-Jabaz is his attorney. He went to the scene where Kiana Ambush was in an apartment where Dr. Khalid Muhammad was vomiting, throwing up profusely, and passed out and collected the evidence. Malik Zulu Shabazz. And this is not my statement. I have the newspaper where it's his statement. He was never indicted by any jurisdiction for tampering with evidence. He put this out in the public as an attorney. He never lost his license because of it. You follow me? All right, tampering with evidence at the scene of a crime. No, in Georgia, it is state law that when a body is found unconscious, it is presumed that there is foul play. Malik Zulu Jabaz stated in the report of the new Black Panther Party that he and Hashim and Zinga, after showing up at the apartment, took rugs and the vomit, urine and fecal matter of Dr. Khalid Muhammad and stored it away for a year to protect it. First of all, they list Dr. Khalid Muhammad's death as a brain aneurysm. Vomiting and shitting on yourself is not connected to having a brain aneurysm. So he took the fecal matter of Dr. Khalid Muhammad and stored it away for a year, allegedly to protect it. That's bullshit. This evidence would have given more possible tangible evidence in regards to the incident that occurred with Dr. Khalid. By allegedly leaving it in a safe place for over a year, the possible evidence became useless. Was this intentional? See, he's never answered these questions in the public. He's never answered these questions.
As an attorney, Shabazz understands that as a possible crime scene, nothing should be removed until dealt with in a safe and efficient manner. He destroyed evidence that would tell us whether Dr. Khalid was poisoned. He is not a regular unlearned person when it comes to law. He is supposed to be a jurist doctor of law. Withholding evidence, Shabazz alleged in the report made by the New Black Panther Party that an unidentified sister in Atlanta possibly tampered with blood samples of Dr. Khalid. However, he never gave her name in the report or since then. Is he protecting her? Or was it another lie? He chose to openly bash the wife of Dr. Khalid for allegedly leaving him with no medical support. Allegations in the report, but never provided the clarity of a, oh, the identity of a person who was allegedly tampering with evidence. No, the allegation of ambush leaving Dr. Khalid for several hours is exclusively the testimony in the report of attorney Shabazz and Hashim Nzinga. Note, Nzinga introduced ambush to Khalid, to Dr. Khalid. She worked at Friedman's as a multi-million dollar store owned by Jews in Atlanta. Where did Hashim meet Ambush? He never gave any history on this. What is Hashim Nzinga's connection with this Jewish multi-million dollar operation? Nzinga sings the song of his dedication to Dr. Khalid, but like Shabazz gives testimony to the natural cause death of Dr. Khalid but little to no evidence to an assassination. So when he died, they was all saying, yeah, man, he had a brain aneurysm, man. He was sick. Dr. Kali was, Dr. Kali was sick. This is a man who eat one meal a day, know how to fast. The lifestyle that I'm teaching you about, we all get trained in, and he was sick. Matter of fact, he did a lecture at, I forget where it was, but then they went to uh, the NBA All-Star game that weekend. So he left, uh, it might have been New York, went to uh, the NBA All-Star game. If it wasn't New York, it was a closer city. Went to Washington, D.C. to the NBA All-Star game. That was on a Sunday. Drove to South Carolina to uh, some restaurant, ate, and then they dropped him off at home in Atlanta to his wife. Why would he, Shabazz, withhold evidence of tampering with blood samples and the identity of the person? So look, if the girl stole blood samples, why wouldn't you be like, yo, so-and-so stole the blood samples? He has never came and told nobody what the name of the person was. This is your teacher, the man you claim you love. And you're going to withhold information that could be vital to give a, 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 a clarity on whether or not there was foul play on his death. So crucial to issues dealing with the man he says he loves. No, remember, it was Shabazz who in a press conference rushed to the presumption that Dr. Khalid allegedly died of natural causes. But this statement becomes very contradictory in light of the alleged knowledge at that time of his allegations of Kiana ambush. One thing about a lie is hard to maintain. Withholding evidence part one. In a speech made by Shabazz, which we will show in the presentation, Shabazz alleged that Conrad Muhammad was given the go to make him, Shabazz, an offer that he would have a mosque in the nation of Islam if he turned his back on Dr. Khalid Muhammad. We have evidence and we'll show it that Shabazz was not the only one to have these offers made to him to turn his back on Dr. Khalid Muhammad. Never identified the parties in the Nation of Islam that made these offers, and since that time has become very friendly with a group that participated in the first attempt to assassinate Dr. Khalid Muhammad. Dr. Khalid Muhammad made the statement that certain FOI were involved in his first assassination attempt. That's not me saying it. That's Dr. Khalid said that. And it's still online on YouTube. You can go and Google Steve Coakley and Dr. Khalid on the assassination plot on his life. And he's saying that out of his own mouth. That's not me making that up. Why were these Negroes never exposed? Or was it another Shabazz lie? Remember, the head of the organization, Louis Farrakhan, praised the death of Dr. Khalid as the works of Allah in his speech we still have today. That's on YouTube. He never atoned publicly for this. He and Shabazz on great terms, and Dr. Khalid is dead. There are several other aspects of this public indictment that we will save for the pre presentation and coming documentary. We never did that documentary. I didn't, I didn't see the need to do that documentary at the time. <clears throat> and the reason why I didn't see the need to do that documentary at the time is because I know other stuff was going to come out, and we have that other stuff now. A discussion on the counterintelligence program is tactical arm for assassination character uh, and for physical assa assassination of character and for physical assassination. All right. 
Intelligence agencies that have attacked the Aboriginal people of America have always used a key and deciding factor to carry out the assassination. That is the sellout nigga. There are several agents still walking among us that are responsible parties for the deaths of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Dr. Khalid, and others who have been character assassinated like Dr. York. Kabbalah is dedicated to making the people who behave in this manner public uh, for the people. Black so-called leaders who have conspired against powerful black leaders making change. Reverend Jesse Jackson worked to assassinate Dr. King and others. Imam Warthur Dean Muhammad worked to create the environment to assassinate Malcolm X and destroy the nation of Islam and establish a pale Arab Islam amongst black people. His own family has testified that intelligence agencies wanted Wallace to take over leadership. Reverend Billy Klaus admitted to his knowledge of the assassination plot of King publicly and his participation. Ben Chavis, a plant in the Nation of Islam, made suggestions for particular people to be killed or harm, and or harmed during the friction period between Dr. Khalid and Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan publicly admitted to participating in the assassination of Malcolm X and was in the Newark mosque when Malcolm X was assassinated. Despised the growing influence of Dr. Khalid and even stated Allah did it killed Khalid himself, has turned away from the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and continuously lies to the people that he is going to a spaceship to renew himself or his body and bring back a book to save people. And I have other people here. All right. Malik Zul Shabazz, tamper with evidence in the Dr. King, excuse, Dr. Khalid Muhammad assassination conspiracy, lies several times in the report, concealing key evidence that and conspiratorial activity from the NOI taking place surrounding the assassination of Dr. Khalid, plotted against the true successor of Dr. Khalid, Sister Malika Muhammad in the New Black Panther Party, Kwesi and Fumu, and nearly the entire CBC. So I ain't gonna go through the people who was attacking me because I was getting under attack under that time, but it's unimportant. It ain't important. Those people are long gone. Or if they're here, you know, whatever, who cares? So look, what am I saying to you? What I'm saying to you is you are surrounded by Agent Smiths and your ass will be grass if you trust these people. Dr. Khalid Muhammad was a beautiful brother. We all have flaws. We all have things that we have to work on. We all have uh, challenges. But if we're good people, they make us better. And the number one thing is when we love our people, we design a purpose in our lives to help them. And we have disagree people have disagreements all the time. What would it have been like if Malcolm and Elijah could have settled their disagreement? What would it have been like if uh, uh, Minister Farrakhan and Dr. Khalid would have settled their agreement? You have divided whole communities, created controversy, uh, choose sides. It's not about choosing sides, bro. There are no sides to choose. We are in a genocidal condition crafted by some very, very, very shrewd people. They will kill you because of what you say out of your mouth. They will kill you for trying to raise the intelligence and the education of people. They will kill you just because you want to see actually your people do better. We have to govern ourselves. There is no way out of it. On the road to doing so, we have many casualties, great people who have come and done great things. I'm not asking you to hate Malik Zulu Shabazz. I'm not asking you to hate Louis Farrakhan. I don't care. I'm asking you to wake up your aboriginal mind and understand where you are and where you might be in 50 years if your ass don't get it together. What if Dr. Khalid Muhammad would have started that plebiscite in the late 1990s? 
Shit, we wouldn't need an Arna. We already would have had it. He died. Shit, they tried to kill me several times. And you know what? I don't even care because you're not going to be able to kill me. This is a little different this time. It's a little different this time. Not saying I can't be killed. Shit, we can all be killed. But this is a little different this time. Because this is not about a charismatic. I'm not a charismatic leader. People try to make me a charismatic leader. No, 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 no. This is something different. I'm activating avatars. And teaching people the very detailed, aspects of the science of mating, the science of business, and the science of warfare inside of a jurisdiction that we have protected to do so. All I'm saying to my people is set up a system of vetting people before you trust them. Because you, you won't know who's for you. That's a dangerous thing. This is what makes people turn away from movements that could help them and go right back into Babylon and sink slowly. And that's what's going to happen to your ass. So you got to find a way to deal with all of this. Shout out to the general, the great one. The one who went all over the earth to help liberate you. The one as a young college student who listened to the words of Minister Farrakhan and said, that's where I want to be. And went in and trained and then watched the nation fall under Wallace Muhammad and went to Africa and said, fuck it, I'm going over here to fight with Idi Amin and all of them and Muammar Gaddafi. I'm not about to stay in America and be a slave. I think his name was Malik Rashidin then or something like that. And then he came back because he saw the minister stand back up. And in his mind, this is the man who uh, inspired me to come into the nation. I'm going to go stand behind him as a loyal soldier. That's a deep thing to have that on your resume, brother. Because when I say have that on your resume, what I'm talking about is uh, setting up your own brother for fame or money or women or some other vice that you have. That should mean nothing. So shout out to the great general, a brother, a friend. Shout out to his family members who lost him and did not get a chance to see him as a grandfather or a great grandfather, you know, who can help guide the community. There's so many brothers who uh, suffered the same fate. But you can't stop. You got to keep going. So I have nothing else to say for you. Hopefully this has given you some wisdom and you can study it for yourself and come to your own conclusions. Don't come to any biases or you feel like I'm biased. Go look up the information that I presented. Study it yourself. See the dynamics because you are at war. You're on the chessboard and whether you want to move or not, you are going to have to participate. And you're either going to participate as somebody who's taking back scenes and dying and falling out on basketball courts and football fields. Or you're going to stand up for yourself and regain your respect as a people across the planet. And that's not a hard thing to do. We live on a very small planet. Most of us have been to different countries and the continents and seen different things. It's your decision. But you will get poor, more divided, more dysfunctional. And if your life don't mean nothing to you, then we, I, you know, I don't know what to say to you. My life means something to me. So. I have nothing else to say to y'all. Thank y'all for your time tonight. Uh, if I have said anything that makes you rattle because you love Minister Farrakhan or you love Malik Zulu Shabazz, I'm not going to stop you. Nothing I can say can stop you from loving them the way that you want to love them. But I am warning you and cautioning you to study and do some research before you come out like. Yeah. 
All right, I'm out of here, man. Thank y'all. Peace.